Hey everybody, thanks for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode. I am your host, Eric, and today the theme of the episode is hatred. Before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're on Spotify, make sure you follow the channel. It's a huge way to help out the channel. And other ways that you can help out the channel is to share these episodes with a friend. If you get something out of it, if you believe in what our mission set is and what we do, please share this with a friend. Also, go check out our other social media outlets, specifically the Normal Barrel and Hatchet channel on YouTube. And also, check out our Patreon channel that directly supports the Hatchet Cast podcast. If you want to be able to give more to continue to help us do what we do here on this show, make sure you go check out the Patreon channel. We do have our first members-only episode that is up on that channel, and uh, it's a really cool way to interact with you guys and also to support the Hatchet Cast podcast. Another way to help support the Hatchet Cast podcast and also Barrel and Hatchet in general is to come train with us. We love training with you guys, and it's super cool to see guys who listen to the show that show up and train with us, and we get to have the opportunity to fellowship with you and talk to you guys and really interact and, and build some awesome relationships. So that's a great way to go check out or check out and how, how you can help us out. And also, you can go check out the website, barrelandhatchet.com, to go see what classes have just dropped. We have a ton of classes that have dropped for the rest of this year. And uh, some classes that have dropped are actually only going to be run like one more time uh, this year before we uh, have the next schedule for 2025. But today is a very special episode. And the reason why it's special is because we actually recorded a podcast last night. Um, and... You know, we had a guest with us, Mark. He is a good friend of ours, and uh, Chris and Seth were in here. And we go to put the card into the computer to be able to take the podcast off and upload it, and it was a bad file. So the only mic that was working was Chris's mic, and so we were like, well, we'll just have to re-record that episode next week, but I did not want you guys to go without an episode, and so... I am recording a podcast with you guys tonight, and the topic of tonight's episode is hatred. Now, if we look around in the world today, there are multiple fronts in terms of war that is on the horizon. I feel like the the apocalyptic horsemen are just over top of the hill. And one of the places that we see war is already established is in Ukraine and in Russia. Now, Ukraine has been losing a lot of territory on the normal front line, and uh, the Russians have been ma- making massive gains. I mean, I think one of the reports said about 12 kilometers of um, movement into enemy territory with just defensive line after defensive line just collapsing. And then their Ukrainians did something that was really interesting, and they made a push into Russia up in the Kursk region. Now, what's really interesting about that is a lot of pro-Ukrainian channels are saying, are, are frustrated with this move because they're like, this has nothing to do with helping the big strategic outcome of the war. And there's still fighting going on up there right now. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but if you watch the press conference, or not the press conference, but the the meeting between the general who's in charge of the district of the Kursk region and Putin, it, it is, dude, it is like, you might have to put on a jacket while you're watching that. Like, you could just feel it was ice cold in that room. And what's crazy is Putin's always been really good about hiding his, his, you know, his emotions. He's like a perfect poker player. Like you, he has no tell. And I've never seen Putin ever emotionally show anything. He's always just like complete zero, just flat, right? You could tell that he was fuming, dude. Like he wanted to literally jump across that table and rip that general's head off. Like, he was so angry. I wouldn't be surprised if that general ends up one day falling out of a really tall building, falling out the window somehow. But we're seeing that there's this incursion, and so the question is, what is Russia going to do? I mean, every red line that's been put up, every single red line has been crossed. So the question is, is like, does the West, does NATO, does Ukraine... Do they even see 
Putin as a serious opponent? Like, do they actually see him as someone who's going to stand by his threats, or are they pretty much saying, man, he's just bluffing the whole time. Like, he's not going to—you He's, you know, we can cross all these red lines, but he's not going to do anything. He's just going—you know, he threatens nukes, but he's not going to nuke us. Like, he, he'll, we, we can keep pushing it. I mean, Russia right now is getting attacked by dr- tons and tons of drones every day from Ukraine, um, to include drones, um, some missiles, missile strikes, and now this incursion into Kursk. And it's a continuous red line that's crossed. You know, there was like, hey, you know, if you send Ukraine F-16s, that's that's the next red line. Well, they got F-16s. And what's crazy is every single F-16 pilot that was, you know, doing this press ceremony with, with Zelensky, they all had their faces covered. And it makes you wonder, like, how many of those pilots are, maybe a couple of them, just for publicity purposes, are actually able to fly the F-16 somewhat well and actually use it proficiently but a lot of that that speculation is that that opens up the door for f-16s from other countries under the guise of ukrainian air force can fly into ukrainian airspace and conduct sorties and also have nato pilots that are flying or contracted pilots that are flying those aircraft and so what's really interesting is that nato knows this Putin knows this, but F-16s are also nuclear capable. They can carry nuclear weapons and deliver them. So you got to think about all of the just craziness that's just happening in Europe right now. And that's not even half of it. If you guys have been looking at what's been going on in the UK, there are literally riots everywhere. I mean, you got protests happening because of the incident with the illegal immigrant that stabbed and murdered three three-year-old girls went into a dance studio. So for those who don't know, in the UK, there was a dance studio like for like kids. And an illegal immigrant, 17-year-old dude, went in there with a knife and just started stabbing all the children. And I'm talking like under the age of eight, like seven and below. Just started stabbing all these children. A couple of adults got stabbed because they were trying to defend the children. And I think eight total people got stabbed. And three of those eight people were three little girls, uh, all under the age of seven, died um, and were murdered by this by this illegal immigrant. And so you have now that being the catalyst that like it's it's been a lot of tension building up in Ireland and England and and all honestly, a lot of these European countries, you're seeing a lot of tension that's built up, but especially in the UK. And so that was like, the boiling point, like that's what blew the lid off. And so you're seeing all of these riots, a lot of UK protesters going out and going into the extreme of just finding anybody that's doesn't speak English and just beating them up. And you're also seeing counter protests where there are illegal immigrants, mostly majority Muslims that are going and having weapons like swords and knives and axes and machetes and counter protesting, and there's been mass stabbings and stuff like that that's been happening. And the, what's crazy, according to a lot of the footage that coming out on X and social media, is you're seeing the police not doing anything when the uh, the British protesters are being stabbed by these illegal immigrants. But when the British protesters are protesting people, they're arresting the Brits. And so you're seeing it's almost like the the police are are helping and on the side of the illegal immigrants. So it just shows how backward things are over there. But like, there is so much hatred that's happening over there, you know, on some of the news media, even Elon Musk said that tweeted that it was possibly going to be a civil war in the UK, which I don't think that'll happen. But what we're seeing is we're seeing that there is just so much animosity and hatred for a lot of just wrong things and evil things that have been happening in the UK for a while, and now it's finally just boiling over. So we're seeing all this, and you're seeing it in France, you're seeing it in Italy, you're seeing it in Ireland, all of these major countries where they're just, they're just like here in the U.S., our border and their borders have been over flooded with all of these illegal immigrants who are just coming there, and they're bringing all of their traditions, all of the things in their society, all of the you know, kind of maybe the not good habits to have in society. They're also bringing those, like you'll see like street vendors with like 
doing the street food thing like you see in India and Pakistan, and there that's happening in the UK. Like it's happening in France, like out on the street. And so you're seeing all of these things that happen, all these cultures, all this clash of societies that is now boiling all over Europe. And you're starting to see a lot of the host nation citizens getting infuriated, essentially. And the government persecuting those people like in fact in in the uk if you repost a tweet that is either supporting the protests or anything anti-immigration like they have no first amendment rights they have no freedom of speech over there right now they're literally arresting people based off of their tweets or off their posts off of what they they share um and so it's just absolutely nuts like and don't think that that can't happen here like that is very very capable of happening here in the States. And in fact, it's already happening a little bit because you have to kind of watch what you say. You have to be careful about like, oh, well, I don't know if I could say that here. Or I don't know if I should mention that. It's already happening here in the States. I think the one thing that you should very clearly and very deliberately understand is that the government is not looking out for you and does not have your best interests in mind. So at least the current one doesn't. Now, hopefully things change, but we're seeing in Europe all of this hatred between all these different people groups are just boiling over, and that's just in Europe. I feel like everything around the world is just one powder keg. It's one spark away from literally exploding into this giant powder keg of just absolute conflict from the top down between governments, between citizens, between people in the streets. Like You're just seeing all of this stuff just kind of this chaos that's just erupting all over the world. Another place that we're seeing it right now also is, you know, today is is we're seeing Iran and Israel. And this is like, what's crazy is Iran, for those who don't know what's going on or don't have the inside scoop, I'm going to give you the cliff notes. But essentially, Iran has closed down their airspace and said, hey, no, we're closing down our airspace. Um, Israel's closing down their airspace, and some of the surrounding countries, I think Lebanon's also closing the airspace down, and the Iranian government has told all businesses to shut down for two days. So either they're expecting attack, they're also, you know, in Israel, they're reopening all of the bunkers. Uh, a lot of the bunkers that haven't been open for a long time, they're reopening those bunkers, they're telling people to get their preps ready. Um, you've got Iranians that are also getting their preps ready. They're actually usually very vocal about all of their military movement and all their capability. Like, oh, we're going to do this exercise and we're moving these long. And they have been radio silent on all of their military movements or any military activity. They've been radio silent, like not making it a public, a public thing or a global thing by showing, you know, kind of flexing their muscles, which means that they don't want Israel or anybody else to know what they're doing because they're prepping for an attack. And it, Iran has already said that they're going to retaliate because of the Hezbollah leader that was killed in Tehran. And what's crazy is the Hezbollah leader that they killed in Tehran was the more mild of the of the leadership. He was the one that was usually willing to talk and kind of negotiate. And the guy that they put in as his successor is more radical. He is more like, no, no talking, no intermediaries, we're done. We're just making stuff happen. And so you're seeing you know, all this boil up, everybody, the Middle East is, is, you're seeing it unite against Israel because of what's been happening in Gaza and what's happened with hummus. And you're seeing all of this kind of accumulate into a boiling point. And the, you know, the U.S. is trying to kind of come in there and be like, all right, well, let's, you know, let's settle things down. But essentially there's no, they have no pull. Like they're at the, we like their U.S. is at the mercy of whatever Israel wants to do. So, you know, if Iran does go full bore and send it, you know, is Russia going to back up Iran? Is China going to back up Iran? And if that's the case, is this the possibility where World War III comes out of the Middle East? Or does it come out of maybe a tack nuke that's shot into Ukraine? I would not be surprised because I think at this point, Russia has little options to be able to say we are dead serious that they would have to shoot a tactical nuke on the battlefield to be able to kind of re-level the playing board in terms of red line and kind of reestablish that, hey, we're not messing around type of posture. Because 
I mean, they've been, you know, red lines are just being crossed. And same with Iran, like red lines are keep being crossed with them or Israel, like that you just see it constantly. And kind of like this pushing and this prodding, like it's almost like these countries want to start more of a fight. They want to really just amp it up and just get it on. So, I don't know. We'll see. The other thing that doesn't help the situation in the Middle East is we're seeing there's a video that has come out of Israeli soldiers, nine of them, sodomizing and raping a Palestinian detainee, possibly a militant, who knows, probably from Hummus, but broke three of his ribs, ruptured his rear end, and when they actually had to send him to the hospital, the doctors are the ones that reported it. And what's crazy is, you know, the Israeli military police arrested these nine soldiers. The Israeli citizens went and protested and broke them out of jail. And then all the charges were dropped. So what do you do about that? What, is, what kind of picture is that painting for the rest of the world to look at? How much animosity continues to grow between these different people groups, between these different nations? And if you're looking at a biblical scale, you can start to see how everyone, how, how those prophecies are coming true that everyone will one day turn against Israel. You're starting to see how those things kind of stack up, just kind of looking at it from a third-person perspective, from, you know, pulled out of that, not completely immersed in that world, looking as just an outsider and being like, hey, here's what you see, you know, the things that are laid on the table. And also, you got to think about the Israelis who are just like under constant bombardment from, you know, attacks from Lebanon, they're under attacks from the Gaza Strip, you know, you're seeing both sides building up animosity for what has happened or what is possibly to come. So we're seeing hatred on that front as well. And then we look at the Far East, you've got China and Taiwan. China is still doing military exercises, and they're ramping stuff up. I was listening to a podcast today that was talking about China and how they how they go about warfare, and they're very engineering-minded, very analytical, very mathematically minded. And so these exercises, which people are just kind of brushing off, is China's way of looking at what are the probabilities that we can win. That's what they're using these exercises for. And once that probability is high enough, and they're like, okay, cool, yep, we have a high probability of winning, which means complete takeover of Taiwan, then they're going to execute. And most likely, the way that they'll do it is they're going to blockade off Taiwan, prevent any any boats from going in there, and then with a couple of days, they're going to mass invade via seaborne invasion and airborne. So you've got that going for you. Now I wonder, it makes you wonder, does China know and has Iran and China and Russia are they waiting? Like, is, is Putin waiting, allowing all these red lines to be crossed because of something that he's agreed with with China and Iran? Or Iran having all these red lines being crossed, and they're like, okay, we're going to wait because it's going to happen. They're going to do all of their retaliations at the same time on the same day. Can you imagine that? Tactical nuke goes off. Multiple tactical nukes go off in Ukraine. I mean, I can literally see the headlines right now all in the same day. Multiple tactical nukes go off in Ukraine. Iran has just shot a thousand missiles and overpowered the Iron Dome and struck it. And also now you've seen uh, Hezbollah has crossed the border into Israel and there's massive firefights all along the border. China has just invaded Taiwan. And military exercises have turned out to be real world invasion. Imagine that. All of that stuff happening at the same exact time. It makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. And, and it, honestly, with the West and NATO and the way that we have all of our militaries at the lowest recruiting numbers, we have Europe is rioting because of all the animosity between the people and their governments. We have our 
elections that are coming up and all the animosity that's coming from that between the left and the right and the hatred that's happening between those two different sides, we're in no position to go fight a war. There's no unity. It's just pure hatred. So you want to talk about here in the States. Here in the States, we have obviously the open border, but we also have Kamala Harris and J.D., or not J.D., but uh, Waze. Look him up real quick because I'm pretty sure that's what his name is. But Kamala Harris's VP pick and... Or Tim Waltz. Tim Waltz is the VP pick. These two people are somehow, the media has just propped them up to be all of a sudden, you know, possibly beating Trump. Actually, right now, if they, according to the polls and mainstream media, if they did the election today, uh, Kamala Harris would win, which we, they think that we forgot that she was literally the most unliked presidential candidate and VP ever. Like, literally despised like by both by everybody everybody democrats and republicans everybody hated her and now all of a sudden she's super popular and then you've got trump with the assassination attempt and jd vance who's just uh according to mainstream media kind of (laughs) weird it's you see all of this happening and what's going to happen if war kicks off And their election is canceled. Or what do you think will happen if Trump is winning in the polls during the election and all of a sudden the next morning you find out Kamala Harris has won? What will happen? Nothing? Possibly. I mean, that's what what we thought in 2020. But are we at a boiling point here in in our own country? Are we at that boiling point yet? I don't know. How many people thought that there would be an assassination tr- attempt on Trump and that he would survive it? How many people thought that four weeks ago? People would be like, oh, yeah, that's a possibility. And other people would just say you're over overreacting. But it happened. How many people would have thought that Joe Biden would be dropping out of the, out of the race two months ago? I know that there was rumblings of it, but nobody expected Kamala Harris to be the presidential nominee that wasn't even voted in but just selected by the DNC which people forget. She wasn't elected into that. She was chosen. They literally just stuck her in there. But that's what happens when you have a side that is so wrapped up in just winning and having power and control. And also, even on the right, there's going to be a pendulum swing. And we're seeing it all over the world. We're seeing this push for a global dominance, a global world power, and we're seeing that governments and and the elite and those who run things behind and control all these different government systems, especially in the West, we're seeing that they have been pushing the people so hard that the pendulum has swung so far to the left that what's coming is that pendulum is going to swing back to the right. And when that pendulum swings back to the right, that's what starts to become scary. Because you're going to start to see what's happening in a very mild way, in my opinion, still a mild way, of what's happening in the UK, where you've got British people, and most, and honestly, right, like, right, they've been, you know, they've been, I can understand where they're coming from, from a human side point, not that I agree with what they're doing by choosing violence, but that is the natural outcome. I could see that, like, I could just predict that was going to happen. You're going to see this pendulum swing to the right, and that's where bad things start to happen. That's where evil is able to take some pretty deep roots. That's where you start to see people getting murdered, people getting beat up, maimed. You start to see the innocent get caught in the middle of it. And it just seems like the entire world is kind of in this melting pot of what's to come, of this civil conflict, of this global conflict. Like, it all just feels like it's all about to blow off at, this, at the same time. 
the stock market crashing, absolutely crashing, and it's still got a lot more crashing to do. And all of that happens quickly. This is why we teach our classes. This is why we are teaching people how to be capable citizens. This is why we teach people, not so you can go out to go choose violence, but that so you can go out to defend the weak and defend your family and defend people who need to be helped that can't defend themselves. And the best form of deterrence has always been a very well-trained force that is standing at the gate saying, no, we, we're not doing that. And they have no choice. In UK, they have in the UK, they have nothing to defend themselves with. So they have no choice. They're getting arrested in their homes. They have no say. And the only say that they're able to have, and, and it's taken to an extreme measure now, which is understandable, is they're rioting in the streets. That's the natural way it's going to happen. It's predictable. That's human nature. All of this, though, is fueled by hatred. And what's crazy is that me talking about all these current events and all of these things is stirring emotion in all of us. And what we have to be careful of is that we don't let hatred take root because that is what is being broadcasted to you by both sides, by any country, every country is broadcasting to you to hate something, to hate someone. There's not a lot of talk of unity right now in the country, except maybe in the community level, except also like in podcasts like ours, talking about uniting, establishing community, coming together. But hatred is a hot topic and it's being preached and taught and pushed and broadcasted 24-7 all around the world. And because of this intense hatred that has been broadcasted and pushed down our throats, the world is one giant powder keg, and all it's going to take is a spark, and it's all going to explode. It's all going to go up. This is why, now more than ever, this is why now more than ever, it is so crucial for us as believers to separate ourselves from the world. We have to remove ourselves from the world and remember who we serve. We serve the kingdom of heaven. We serve the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, Abba, Father, Yahweh. That is who we serve. In the things of this world, when you take a step back and you look at it from the Lord's perspective, it's all just sad. It's sad. We see all of this hatred that is happening all across the world. We're seeing all of these things happening. And so I want to read to you from a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we read here, it says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustices, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. 
never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. In that very definition of love, and I see this and I hear this a lot, especially in the preparedness community or the the, the folks who listen that are patriots, that are, are proud to be an American, that are capable citizens of that giving up. Nah, well, it's it's done anyways. Yeah, that might be that might be true. But don't ever give up on the people. The system may be may be gone. But the people are not. And our mission set is not to go and hate the other side. To fuel hatred, which is what Satan wants the entire time from both sides. And he's getting it from every side, from every country, from everywhere. He's getting exactly what he wants. He wants people to hate each other, to harm each other, to kill each other. Because God has given us two commandments. Two commandments that Satan is trying to get every single one of us to break. And for us as believers, we have to not break those two commandments. And the first one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is, love your neighbor as yourself. And I can tell you right now, if you try to do number two without number one, which I've tried, and I've failed, and, in, and instead of me trying to love my neighbor as myself on my own, under my own power, without loving the Lord, I end up getting resentful because that person, I show them love and they wrong me. Or I do something for someone and they burn me. Or I try to be kind and I just get rudeness back. And eventually you try doing that under your own power. It will make you bitter and resentful. And eventually you're no longer loving your neighbor as yourself. You've said, I've given up. Humanity stinks. And it's not worth it. How many times have you seen where police officers go in and they're super excited to help out their community, and by the time they're done with their career, they're just like they see the worst side of people? And rightly so. You know, they have almost a, 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 a dark humor about it, but you see the worst side of people. Nobody calls a police officer to see how they're doing. They call them on their worst day of their life. So if you try to do number two on your own, eventually you'll fail. The reason why number one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul is when you start to do that, you truly take that seriously, like I did recently. God will shape your heart to be molded after His. He will start to shape your heart like His, and Jesus loves everyone. He doesn't accept sin, but he loves the person. He loves everyone. And you'll start to find as you're walking that walk with the Lord and you're loving the Lord, like I have started to fall in love with the Lord recently. I'm talking with the past several months of truly finally understanding that relationship and what that means. I find my heart getting bigger. I find myself loving people more, people I've never even met. I find myself more willing to give my time, to answer questions, or to have compassion. And that's not a trait that I've ever had. I've had that towards my family and my kids and stuff like that and some people I care about. But that's not a trait that I've always had. That is what happens when you follow rule number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Rule number two starts to become more natural. And it starts to become easier to love your neighbor. Why? Because God is loving that person through you. And the world is teaching you to hate everything. The one thing that sticks out to me in this, in this 1 Corinthians 13 is it says, it does, Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. How many times have someone maybe wronged you and you talk about it to a family member or a friend years later? Oh man, that person freaking, you know, did this to me or whatever. Love does not keep record of wrong. And it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And that is why it is so important for us to still seek wisdom and knowledge and understand 
what's going on and love people through the circumstances that they're going through right now, the way that the world is going, turning into a giant powder keg, the one thing that can be a, a fight against evil is to love people. When the world and evil forces are teaching hatred, the best way to do spiritual warfare is to love your neighbor as yourself. And it starts with your family. It starts with your coworkers. It starts with the people in your church or your community or your friend or your brother, your sister. It starts with them, your parents, loving them. And when I say love, truly loving them in a way where you expect nothing in return. It's called unconditional love. It's the love that Christ has for us. There's nothing that we can do to accept it, and he gives it freely without looking for anything in return. There's no works that you can do to earn his love. He gives it freely. And when you give, when he gives you that love, that is a gift that you accept. And this is a a message for those who are not believers in the Lord, and you've been listening to the podcast, and you've been curious, like, like I was, like there was just this emptiness that was inside of you, this gaping hole that nothing could fill, no money, no aspirations, no job, no goals, no things, no items, no guns, no, none of it. None of it could fill the gaping hole that was in my heart, except for Jesus. And once that happened, my life changed fundamentally. Once that happened... My life was radicalized, and I just fell in love with the Lord. And in turn, I started to love my neighbor more. And for Christians out there, especially a lot of us, especially like how I was, I had accepted that gift from the Lord. I had that, like, it's described as a foundation of a house. I had that foundation, right, that gift that God gave me, that love, I accepted that relationship, and I had the foundation of the house. But I have to go out and start to build the house. So I'm going to read a a portion from Imagine Heaven from Pastor John Burke, and this is for believers. This This was very convicting to me and something that really spoke to me about how we should be living our life as believers right now. The Bama Seat. At some point after Earth's history concludes, another judgment happens called the Bama Seat. It's a judgment for God's children. Yes, there is a judgment for believers. For we must appear all before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10. The word translated judgment is the Greek word bema, which refers to the judge's seat at the ancient games like the Olympic judges stand. This was the place where the judges would award the gold or silver medals, crowns in their day, quote-unquote, for a race well run. It's a judgment of rewards. God loves to reward every faithful act, deed, even motive, and that's what will happen at the bema seat judgment. We don't earn God's gift earn God's love or acceptance into heaven. That's a gift we receive or reject. But all our deeds determine our experience of heaven, what we take with us from this life. Paul uses an analogy of building a house. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 8, 11 through 15. Each person will be rewarded for their own hard work. No one can lay any foundation other than one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Paul pictures some people who came to faith and lived their lives investing in things of eternal value, and what they built with their life will stand and bring great reward eternally. Others received God's gift but lived mostly for themselves. Imagine a person running out of a burning house. They are safe. 
but everything they worked for just went up in smoke. What you do with this life really matters. Every moment of this life matters more than you ever imagined. The Bama seat is where Jesus rewards us. It's like a huge Oscar celebration for all of God's children across human history. You thought the red carpet was a big deal. You ain't seen nothing yet. God promises to recognize and reward every single person personally. It's going to be the most rewarding thing you've ever imagined. Uh, Isaiah looked forward to it saying, See, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him. Isaiah 62, 11. Jesus said, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory, glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Matthew 16, 27. So let's imagine that day and live for the things that God rewards. That stuck with me. Because for my whole life, well, ever since I became a believer, I just had a foundation. I just had the house. I accepted that relationship, and I did not build upon that. The foundation, the relationship is free. That's freely given. But what you do with your life after that relationship, you build. And what I had done is I had taken my foundation, I put hay and straw and wood, a.k.a. my worldly aspirations, my goals. Oh, God wants me to get this promotion. God needs me, you know, God wants me to have this so that way I can travel to go, you know, do nice things for people. God wants me to have this money so I can give to the poor more. That, that's, that's what it was. He wants me to get this raise so that way I can do more to, you know, give, give to people. While at the same time, doing all of these aspirations for myself, truly, selfishly, living for me, doing nothing for the kingdom of heaven, nothing of real value, not loving my neighbor as myself, not truly loving the Lord my God with all my heart, but accepting that relationship with him and then being like, all right, I'm going to go do my own thing. I was building a house of garbage. It was literally a shanty. Imagine an amazing foundation and you put a plywood shack shanty on top of it. I am done running my race. I am done building my house out of garbage materials. And I think that a lot of us, myself included, I'm, I'm speaking mostly to myself, have always gone through life saying, hey, I'm going to go chase my goals. I'll pray that God will bless me as I go pursue my goals. I'll throw a cherry of a prayer on top to kind of, you know, you know sweeten, it, sweeten it all up. And then whenever I don't get my goals or I don't get what I want, I'm going to blame God for it or ask God why. instead of actually living for the plan that he had for my life. When he designed me, and he designed you, before the foundations of the earth were even created, he knew exactly what you were, he exactly what you had a purpose for, exactly the road that he wanted you to walk, and the amazing things that he was excited to see you do in your life. Before the world was even created, he knew those things. Talk about a letdown. <laughs> imagine God knowing exactly that he was going to make me before the world even began, and then I am made, and I'm walking my life, and I start, oh, like, he's like, oh, I, I, come on, I have this great plan for you. There's, like, literally it's awesome thing. You're going to love it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to go do this. He's like, I waited all this time. <laughs> and, I, and this is where the humanity of me, I'm like, God, how do you have so much patience with us? That's why I will never understand God's patience and his love until one day I'm with him. Because I look at things through a human scale and be like, I would not have put that much patience with me. I would not have had that much time spent trying to get me back on track to follow the plan that you had for me. But God never gives up. And he wants you to build on that foundation. One, because you're going to get satisfaction out of it that is so pure and so awesome that nothing else in life can satisfy you afterwards. Nothing can fill your life like working and serving the Lord and loving the Lord. There is nothing more fulfilling. The apostles lived in absolute poverty. Paul was writing these letters from prison, but yet he was fulfilled because the Lord fulfilled him. 
And the earth will always tell you that it can fulfill you by giving you a mission set to hate these other people or like, hey, you know, here's this campaign or here's what you need to focus on and put all your energy into it. And yeah, like get prepped and make sure that you have all this ammo and trained and all this stuff, which are great things. But we look at it from a perspective of me, me, me. When instead we could be training and we could be prepping and we can be doing all these things in preparation for when hard times come so that way we have a great magnitude of which we can help others and love other people during a time of absolute atrocities. That is how we, as Christians and as capable and prepared citizens, need to look at how we prep and how we train with those two commandments in mind, with loving the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, and soul, and loving my neighbor as myself, being willing to protect my neighbor, being willing to protect the needy, being willing to feed those who are going to be starving and take in those who are going to need shelter. That time will come. And man, if you are prepared you will have an amazing capacity to share God's love with somebody. And as they're coming and receiving shelter and protection, you're feeding them. Now you can present them the true hope that can fulfill them, even during a time where everything has collapsed and fallen around you. And that is to provide them the hope that Jesus Christ brings to the world, the love that he brings and gives to you freely. But you have to stop building your house out of foundation, out of materials on a foundation that's pure. Stop building your house in materials like I did that are trash, that are my own aspirations that pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. I'm not wasting another minute of my day pursuing my own aspirations and goals. I'm done. I'm done with it. I'm not spending another minute of my day running this race of life, pursuing things or money or position or fame. All of it is going to be towards serving the Lord. And you have to have a mindset change. And I'm still going through that mindset change. I'm not perfect. There's times when I stress out about things coming, you know, Marilyn Hatchett going through a hard time. Things are running slow. And I immediately want to stress out. And God's like, I'm here, dude. I'm driving the boat. Like you're sitting on the boat. You, there's a storm, but I'm driving it. Just hang out. Enjoy the ride. Come come hang out with me up at the, at the captain's wheel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs? but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training, and they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might dis- get disqualified. Train yourself by reading the Word of God. Read your Bible. I was so bad at this. And once it started to click for me to read my Bible, it's like food. It is like sustenance for your soul, for your spirit. And pray to the Lord. Just talk to Him. That's what a relationship is like. You talk to the people that you love. Talk to the Lord. If you have problems, talk to Him. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. Talk to the Lord. He wants to talk to you. The Holy Spirit wants to advocate for you and intercede for you on your behalf. Jesus loves who you are. He designed you exactly the way you want. He loves your sense of humor. He loves little quirks about you. He loves the goofiness that you have. He designed you in all those ways. He loves talking to you. So talk to him. And in that, you will worship because you will want to worship just like you give praise to your mom and your dad or the people that you look up to in your life. You will naturally praise the Lord. But you got to fulfill those two commandments. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Read your Bible. Equip yourself. Feed your soul. Talk with the Lord and pray with him. And continue to train your body. Continue to prep. Continue to increase your skill set. So that way when people come up to you, they feel man, I have confidence in this guy because one, he's able to protect, he's he's an asset to the team, but something's different about him too. Like, he has this hope. How can you be hopeful in a time where society has collapsed? How can you be hopeful? And you will have the perfect opportunity to be able to pour out the love of Jesus into these people. When the time comes and society collapses, people are going to be dying for hope. And you will have the best hope and the best thing that you could provide that is sweeter than any honey and more fulfilling than any food. And that is the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. And for those who do not know Jesus and you don't know who he is, and you're looking to establish that relationship and start building that foundation of that house, God has been wanting to talk to you for so long. He has been looking to establish a relationship with you for your whole life. And you are not hearing this podcast and hearing this message on accident. If you have had a foundation established with the Lord and you just stop building on your house and you're building it with your own goals, you are not hearing this podcast by accident. This is the the Holy Spirit is using this podcast to speak to you, to be able to turn back to Him, to establish that relationship with Him just like I have. It took me 34 years to figure it out. But man, it's been so fulfilling. And God wants you to have joy through him so that you may live life full of joy and live it in the fullest. And the life that is that we're living in now is a race. So run your race well. For those who aren't saved and don't know Jesus, God wants to talk to you. He wants to establish that relationship with you. He loves you. He knows you more than you know yourself. And he wants you to come home and live in the comfort and peace that he can provide. Only he can. The world will always try and say that it can provide you comfort. And it's going to make you run the rat race of life. And you'll end up empty every time but God can give you fulfillment that nothing else can, and you don't have to work for it. All you have to do is just accept it. Accept his love that he paid for your sins when he died on the cross and he rose again in three days and ascended back into heaven. He did that for you, and you're not hearing this podcast by accident. So guys, I want you to, if you don't know who the Lord is, email us at team at barrelandhatchet.com. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to pray with you. Email me. If you're going through a hard time, even if you're a Christian, you're going through a rough time, email me. We'll pray about it. I'll put it on my prayer list. But make sure, guys, that you are going out there and you are loving people, that you are following those two commandments. The world's already full enough, uh, uh, full of enough hatred already. Don't add to the hatred. Have that spiritual fight by fighting against the spirits of darkness, by loving other people, by loving your neighbor like you love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Run the race and run it well. Guys, we'll see you. Make sure you train to be the eternal asset, and I'll see you on the next one.